All right. Assalamu alaikum, everybody. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Let's have everybody come into the room from the waiting room. My name is Susan Labadi. I am a member of the um, ISNA planning committee, also a CISNA board member. And my introduction to the topic of mindfulness, you have Brother Wadud and myself uh, slated as your presenters. Um, Brother Wadud is a teacher of mine, and so our companies have aligned. And so with his situation today, we double booked him. He's working with the Productive Muslim on his own mindfulness uh, class, a master class that I'm also attending, but obviously not today. And so the um, timings of both are, are kind of correlated together. So what will happen is that I will begin his slide deck as I'm fully informed as to what the content is and have been studying this for a few years. And then he will also come in to um, wrap up the session. This session is gonna go for two uh, periods long. So I wanted to share with you that the timings are going to be a little bit different. You might want to jot this down. So for Eastern time from one to 1.30, um, you're going to be having this section and it might go to maybe 140. And instead of a break that you see in your program guide from two to three, you will so return. You will return at, um, at 2.30 and you will go until four o'clock. If you're on central time, the timing is going from 12 o'clock until 12.30 and you will return at 1.30 and go until three o'clock. Uh, for the Pacific Coast people, we are starting at 10 o'clock. It goes to about 10.30 or so, and you will return back from break at 11.30 and go all the way through until the end. So inshallah, the little change in schedule will um, you know, work out fine. I would encourage you after you finish with this particular section, maybe you wanna go into another track. If you've got the stamina, you wanna take more notes. And so this gives you the opportunity to see some other presentations as well, if you so choose. But with that, um, I would like to suggest that you have your, your cell phones turned off and you get a journal ready to do a little bit of work because we're going to dive into working on trying to make our schools more resilient. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank you for, thank you for taking the time. And this is something that, you know, as even was mentioned by um, Brother Habib, we need to take time for self-care. And it's so important because, you know, everybody is relying on you, the ship floats on your back to a great extent. And you need to have your opportunities to recharge. And it helps to have some insights. Even the previous speaker, Brother Oman, Osman Umarji, was talking about how people need to know about child development. Well, US teachers need to know about neuroscience. And so there is a lot of information that confirms that the work that we do with meditation, with mindfulness, with awareness, and helping people understand, first of all, themselves, and then move on to with the people that they work with in their, their communities, their colleagues, their students, their families. We all help each other. We need to be able to take time to focus and to think and to really tune in because many times we're running like crazy and we're just thinking about the next bajillion things we need to do. So in, in spirit of trying to help you to learn that um, you know, this is something that will benefit not only you, but your families, your families and your, your schools, I think inshallah you will get some benefit from it. So with that, I wanted to get a little insight as to how you're feeling today. So if you would please, if you go to menti.com on your phones, pardon me, <clears throat> you can enter in the code at menti.com 9360-9140 and give me three words about how are you arriving today? One word for body, one word for mind, and one word for heart. I'll give you a minute to get that done and keep the prompt up there and check my messages. Okay, we're wearing many hats today. Mm 
one word for body, one word for mind, one word for heart. How are you feeling today? Let's get a sense of how the mood is for everyone. And take a peek to see what we have for our results. Sour on one foot. Well, that's the first time I've seen that. Let's take a lafia. Inshallah, you feel better. Okay, they're coming in. Great, focused, healthy. I mean, this is just the beginning of, of awareness, you know, oftentimes do you even ask yourself, you know, gosh, I've got so many things I'm, I'm doing so much on my mind, but how am I feeling physically, mentally, emotionally? Anxious, tired, rich, relaxed, thankful, having ease, open, excited, happy. Alhamdulillah, a lot of positivity. That's wonderful. Okay. Let's go back to our slide deck. All right, and for current slide, here we go. All right. What we like to do, and you might consider doing this even for your students in the future, is when they come into your classroom, have a mindful arrival. Because oftentimes they too, if you know, you're transitioning from one subject to another, or if they're coming from another class, if you're in a middle school or high school, or even if they're coming back from the library or a gym, in order to improve their focus, you want them to be able to be in the moment with you. So there's something that we oftentimes will use called three breaths. And it goes like this. You're going to take one breath that's going to be a large inhale and a very long prolonged exhale. This will activate your parasympathetic system to help you relax. Second is you wanna sort of check in with your body on the second breath to see how are you feeling and then try to relax every aspect of your body. Oftentimes we hold a lot of tension in our jaw and our shoulders. We may even be like clenching our fists or curling our toes, not realizing that. And then the third breath is about what's important now and try to be focused, ready to learn, ready to teach in your case, receptive to the people that are around you. So let's do this together for a start and inshallah you will get maximum benefit from the content of this presentation. Ready? First deep breath in and a long slow exhale out. Another deep breath in and sense your body. Where might you have nervousness or tension? Try to relax, tune other things out. And another inhale in. And let's get ourselves primed and ready for our presentation, inshallah. Okay. What we want to do today is cover a few things in this presentation that I will start off and Brother Wadud will continue with. We're talking about resilience and compassion. And the studies are, are ever increasing as to the efficacy of these things. We know, especially with this COVID year, it's been very rough. And for all of the reasons, as Brother Habib had mentioned in his keynote speech, so we want to be able to learn a bit about resilience as you will in this presentation. And the part that he will take on is mostly then about compassion. We'll talk a bit about that though as well. Heart of Compassion is the model that it's an acronym. Each of it has a part. Inshallah, I will get you through the HEA and Brother Wadu will give you the RT of compassion. And he will also in the second session have a guided compassion practice, which is a wonderful experience that inshallah you will enjoy. And then finally, we want you to come out of this with some active points, things that you're going to deliberately do to improve your schools. So you're going to do a little bit of brain work, knowing your schools best, your schools needs best as to how you might implement some of these things that you've learned today. So with that, resilience is the ability to overcome obstacles along the way. 
along the way for a good working de definition, sorry, is an ability to recover from or adjust easily to misfortune or change. Again, an ability to recover from or adjust easily to misfortune or change. And it's something that can be taught and it has three main parts. So you might wanna take some notes, all right? The first part of resilience is the sense of inner calm. And you know, we get our inner calm, I think mostly from our relationship with Allah and also by practicing calm because what you practice grows stronger. So if you're a person that is um, you know, constantly looking at things uh, from a negative perspective, or if you're grumbling and griping a lot, we have to be careful because in our brains, the way that we are structured, the more you emphasize something, the more it becomes ingrained. So if you're more of an optimist, a positive person, a happy person, an energetic person, these are the traits that you actually instill. And it's not to say that you can't change them, but it might take some effort. So when we do our prayer, when we see tumult on Kregas or around us and we're able to practice calm, we become stronger in being able to achieve calm. That's number one, inner calm. Number two will be emotional resilience. And that's basically to know that our successes and our failures can yield strong emotions. So if you would um, write in the chat, I wanna see if I could pick up the chat from even my phone that I'm having running concurrently with again, my echo in my, my, mirror, my ear here about how you feel when you've had a failure. Try to empathize, try to think about how it is that you feel when you have a failure and pop that if you would into the chat and I'll see if I can monitor hopefully that. How do you feel when you've had a failure? Okay, now they're coming through. Feel down and unsuccessful a sense of shock, disappointed, frustration, sad, sad. I want to win it. Doesn't matter how many failures I have to face. All right, yes. And now specify, how do you feel in your heart when you had a failure? There's a difference. How does your heart specifically feel? Okay, we're talking about when you've had a failure, how does your heart feel? Down but trust Allah subhanahu will fix it, unsettled has big pump, okay. Next, how does your stomach feel? Is there a difference? How might your stomach feel? And do you ever like really check in with yourself? If you're mindful, you watch for your physiological cues to tip you off as to what might be going on. Or, you know, sometimes we don't realize that <laughs> that we're running like crazy until our bodies tell us we're exhausted, right? So what is it that you might feel in your stomach? No feeling in the stomach, stomach upset. Initially, my stomach had a weird feeling. Yeah, we've all had failures, right? So we can relate. And when the people around us have failures, we also can, can feel with them because we've been there, right? All right, now consider if you had a friend in the same scenario, what would you tell them? You don't have to write this in the chat, but just think about, you know, you have your own experience, but if you had a friend that had that same experience, what is it that you might tell them? Okay, now let's flip the scenario. 
let's say that you've had a success. Think about how is it that you would feel? How does your heart feel? How does your stomach feel? If it happened to your friend, how would you support them? What kind of dialogue do you think that you would have with them for that? This, this is emotional resilience. It's sort of when you become a good friend to yourself. This will be part of the compassion that you will learn later. So the next part, the third part is a cognitive resilience. And this is your explanatory style if, of like interpreting your setbacks. So a part of that might be that you need to take a step back and, and somewhat disassociate from a bad experience. And we find that people fall into two categories. You've got people who are more of the pessimists and then you have people that are more of the optimists. And the pessimist is gonna say, oh, I'm no good. I'm, I'm never going to be able to be good at something or win at something or accomplish something that, that lack of a growth mindset, right? That's the pessimist. But the people who are more resilient are tending to be optimists. And they may say, well, that's unfortunate, but you know, what can I do to improve? Things happen, but they don't define themselves necessarily by that, that negative experience or by that failure. So it's good to understand your three main points of, of resilience, inner calm, emotional resilience, and a cognitive resilience is basically reflecting on how you're going to think about something. And that makes all the difference in the world. So again, here's your definition for resilience. All right. Now, I want you to take a look at this. And again, in the chat, share with me, this past year, what changes did you experience as a school community? Do the first question first only, please. What changes did you experience as a school community? Here we go, okay. Total disconnect from staff, deeper connection with students. Got isolated from one another and working through Zoom only. Yeah, it's different, isn't it? What changes did you experience as a school community? No communication between departments, admin and teachers. Challenges with health of staff, parents and children. Working without hug from the kids. Yeah, we're gonna to touch on that. Hybrid learning provided more resources that we were not initially aware of. Yeah, there were some negatives, there were some positives. And even again, reflecting back on what brother Habib said, you know, it's kind of pointed out to us some of our holes and has given us the opportunity to, to try to fortify them and fix them so that inshallah, we're gonna come through this better. Now tackle the second question in the chat, if you please. What are your greatest needs? We had to adjust to a lot of new technological practices. Our school policies kept changing and it was stressful. At times admins were also confused and learning new ways to adjust, right? More resources through hybrid learning. Yes, you got to know your students' home situations, but it did let us realize a lot of things as individuals. Connection matters, communication, professional development for virtual learning and SEL, big time, yes. Need to keep the students engaged and motivated, definitely. We'll give it a few more seconds if anybody else wants to share. Okay. 
we need to keep students engaged and teachers need more professional development on the new technology. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for those insights. It's helpful for us. All right, let's take it down to the next slide. Compassion is a well being strategy that prevents burnout. So your focus is on the other with compassion rather than on yourself. And it's really about service. Um, I'll give you a definition of compassion. It's the capacity to be attentive to the experience of others, to wish the best for others, and a sense to sense what will truly serve. So this is your official definition of compassion, the capacity to be attentive to the experience of others, to wish the best for others, and to sense what will truly serve. You feel a lot of heart even just in that definition. But many people talking about heart confuse compassion with empathy. Now, empathy is that you, you empathize, you basically can feel the experience of the other. But compassion takes it a step further. It is empathy plus an action, which Brother Wadud will also review later with you. But it's really about taking an active, positive kindness, sort of, uh, uh, I wish them well at the very least. If you can't actively do something, the very least you can do as part of compassion is to make dua for someone, wish them well, and let them know that you are there for them. So as it turns out, they've done some studies on compassion and one in particular noted that the participants who practiced compassion, actively, deliberately practiced compassion, were definitely more mindful and had an increase in their happiness. Whereas others uh, that did not found themselves to be stricken by more worry and or emotional suppression. A Quranic reference is about how Allah instructed the Prophet Sallallahu to be compassionate. And it comes to us from Surah Ali Imran. And here is the English translation. And with that, let's begin with the heart model to more fully understand how to implement compassion for our students and families. By the way, Brother Wadud and Sister Shaza and I are working on a summer compassion coach certification program that you might be interested in. With our kids suffering from fear so much and trauma this past year, we wanted to give schools trainings that could actually heal and change the culture of our schools to be models of compassion. Sister Shaza had told us that the results of the ISLA alumni study revealed a lot of bullying that we weren't even aware of. And that um, plus COVID has really motivated us to try to create this program. So please ask Brother Wadud about it when you see him later on this afternoon. And also I wanted to review for those of you who have come in late, the break schedule that we're going to have as he is with the Productive Muslim Mindfulness course right now in session. That's why I'm taking over for the first part of this. And so normally in your program, you're going to see that you have a break from two o'clock to three o'clock Eastern time. But for our purposes today, we're only going to go a few more minutes and then you have the chance to go jump into some other sessions if you want, but please be sure that if you're on the East Coast timing, that you're going to come back at 2.30 until four. And then if you're on central timing, you're going to um, come back at 1.30 until three. And if you're on the Pacific timing, you're going to be coming back at 11.30 and you go until one o'clock. Um, if you're on mountain time, you're in the middle of those two. So figure that out, okay? All right, let's go on. So we start with that heart model that I mentioned and the first acronym letter is going to be H for heart. It also stands for healing presence. So this is referring to um, speaking of the heart um, is really a book I wanted to mention for everybody to know about. Um, if you could see here, I'm trying to hold that. So it's with the heart in mind by Sheikh um, Mikhail 
Ahmed Smith is a wonderful read. If you're part of the Productive Muslim uh, Book Club, they're reading it right now. I read this about two years ago. I, I've got you know tape flags in it and really wanted to um, reread it again, but I've got a backlog of other books, but it's chock full, it's, even though it's a thin book, a lot of really great information. And um, really what he's working on right now, Sheikh Mikhail, is working on a book about listening. And this really nails the, the target because by listening to people and being mindful, like the Prophet Sallallahu would face with his heart open to people, he was a great listener. This is, I think, something that we've never really put as much value on as we have before so that we understand, to understand each other, to have communication with each other. You need to listen first without that, um, what am I gonna say next type of thing going through your mind. And really just being there, being the sounding board perhaps for somebody is maybe the, the best thing that you can do. So being aware of their, their nonverbal and um, their emotional factors is something that's very critical to the healing presence. And an illustrative story about that is um, a young man named Josh Yunt, who lives in London, Ontario. And, and he was bullied a lot in his school, but when he went to a different school, he decided to do something a little bit different. When he transferred schools, he started opening the doors for his classmates. And the funny thing is that just the mere action of opening a door and being there consistently every day um, people got to know him. People started to like him. He would just say good morning to people and nothing more than that. And he found that it was so powerful that he wrote, me opening a door is more than a physical act. It's about putting yourself out there and getting to know people, making them feel comfortable, making them feel welcome. So as teachers, as administrators, something as simple as just being seen, saying good morning, being pleasant, Maybe you've not calculated the value of it, but it is very significant. And it gives people hope. When a day would come that he might be absent, people genuinely missed him. So my question to you, and you might want to jot this down in your own journal, is how do you communicate that you care to your students, to your colleagues? And what is it about your presence that lets them know and then finally, what might you do to show that you care? So take a minute to reflect on that and jot something down. Perhaps there's something more that you can do, especially with the changing paradigm of how we teach. What can you do? Sister Azra mentioned, I check them individually calling their names. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's move on. E, the next letter in the acronym is to empathize, empathize. Feeling with what they are feeling, connecting with others, being in the same boat as them. And it's to be saying okay to them that they're feeling what they're feeling, whatever it might be, so that they're not feeling alone and to help them in working with their emotions. And sometimes when emotions become very intense, there are strategies, mindfulness strategies that you can implement that will help people to, to sort of release the emotions and, and look at them perhaps from an outsider's perspective and make a judgment on how they want to contend with what those emotions are. There was a research study that was done by Zufiano in 2017 in Switzerland. And the study was done to really better understand the co-development of sympathy and aggression in children ages six to 12. And it was found that children that have an underdeveloped sense of sympathy for others tended to elicit increased levels of aggression, pointing to the fact that bullying occurs when children do not have the cognitive or empathetic ability to better understand the perspective of others. 
And understanding the perspective of others is an ongoing thing. It does not happen um, more fully until a bit later in life. So as adolescents are developing, you want to be able to highlight for them, reflect or have them reflect more on how do you think that person feels? If you're working through a novel, how did you think that character felt? What prompted this action? What perhaps contributed to some event you know, that happened to somebody else? Try to get them to be in touch with feeling. And I think these days, many people have sort of uh, subjugated, you know, put their feelings under the ground so that they don't feel so deeply, so suffering intensely. But one of the things that's important to know is that in Islam, we want to keep our hearts soft. So lest anybody wishes to have a heart of stone because life seems like it's unbearable it is not the request. That's not the dua we want to make. We really want to be able to be sure that we keep our hearts soft. And in practicing mindfulness, we find that the amygdala, the part of our brain that sort of will engage with that emotion, decide if this is something to fear or something to welcome, it's a little bit less reactive in people who practice mindfulness. They're able to separate and not go into that flight or fight mode as easily when they've developed their capacity to do mindfulness. And oftentimes that is through meditation. I have a short video to share with you. I think you will like that. Um, inshallah, it will play. Let's see if we can get this to kick in. And Sister Patricia, please verify for me if you're able to hear it when it finally starts. Okay. And it's scrolling. Yeah, it's scrolling now. Let me stop it and then try to start again. There we go. <gasps> Here we go. Can you hear? Yes. So what is empathy and why is it very different than sympathy? Empathy fuels connection. Sympathy drives disconnection. Empathy, it's very interesting. Teresa Wiseman is a nursing scholar who studied professions, very diverse professions where empathy is relevant and came up with four qualities of empathy. Perspective taking, the ability to take the perspective of another person or, or recognize their perspective as their truth. Staying out of judgment, not easy when you enjoy it as much as most of us do. <laughs> Recognizing emotion in other people and then communicating that. Empathy is feeling with people. And to me, I always think of empathy as this kind of sacred space when someone's kind of in a deep hole and they shout out from the bottom and they say, I'm stuck, it's dark, I'm overwhelmed. And then we look and we say, hey, and climb down. I know what it's like down here. And you're not alone. Sympathy is, ooh, <laughs> it's bad, uh-huh. <laughs> uh, no, you want a sandwich? <laughs> um, empathy is a choice and it's a vulnerable choice because in order to connect with you, I have to connect with something in myself that knows that feeling. Rarely, if ever, does an empathic response begin with at least. I had a, yeah. And we do it all the time. Because you know what? Someone just shared something with us that's incredibly painful, and we're trying to silver lining it. I don't think that's a verb, but I'm using it as one. We're trying to put the silver lining around it. So I had a miscarriage. Oh, at least you know you can get pregnant. I think my marriage is falling apart. At least you have a marriage. <laughs> John's getting kicked out of school. At least Sarah is an A student. But one of the things we do sometimes in the face of very difficult conversations is we try to make things better. If I share something with you that's very difficult, I'd rather you say, I don't even know what to say right now. I'm just so glad you told me. Because the truth is, rarely can a response make something better. What makes something better is connection.
Is that not true? Okay. Let's see if we can come back to my slide. Inshallah. There we go. Yeah, I'm really happy that, I mean, that was a great role model to like, when somebody lays a bomb on you, something really heavy and you don't know what to say, it's really great to just say, wow, I really don't know what to say, but you know, I'm here for you if there's anything that I can do because it's, it's rough, you know, and they don't necessarily need to hear an answer other than just to know that you're there for them. So our Prophet Wasallam had his, his share of difficulties and I know all of us do, our students do, their families do, but I also know that when we're spread thin, then you know having the bandwidth to take care of the weaker, the needy ones, it's really exhausting at times. And so that's why our own self-care is vitally important so that we can have the capacity with Allah's help to help them. And as we see here, the reward for doing it is so great. So that's why my own work um, is now devoted to working on studying and creating courses for stress reduction. And I've posted my first mini course and um, it's at susanlovedy.com if you're interested. And I think that, you know, we want to make sure that we take care of ourselves. It's that old, put your oxygen mask on first thing so that you're able to help other people as well. And then finally, in this part of the segment of the presentation, we're going to look at affirmation. And this is basically to acknowledge the power that you have to light up the room, cheer each other up, be a positive person, um, give attention to people, have some quality time together, really, for everybody in our lives, we want to give them some type of affirmation. And with that, two more slides to share with you. Hugs do go a long way. I know we can't always hug necessarily, but there was a study, so maybe even the people in your own family, by author and family therapist Virginia Satter. She said, we need four hugs a day for survival. We need eight hugs a day for maintenance, and we need 12 hugs a day for growth. In a gender appropriate and Islamic way, we also have the beautiful prophetic examples of shaking hands, having the heart on the chest and making dua and not letting go of the hand if you are holding someone's hand and hugging and kissing our own children. Brain research tells us that oxytocin, which is the feel good chemical is released into the body only after physical contact lasting about eight seconds. And I think we don't usually keep our hugs going as long, but if somebody's ever hugged you for a good long time, don't you certainly feel it more deeply. So try to extend those hugs. And babies and young children also have um, not evolved to be able to manage stress and upset on their own. Dr. Lucy Brown Wright, pediatric neurodevelopmental psychologist who's written The Child and Family Practice. And she writes that through having regular positive interactions that encompass gentle soothing and cuddling when the child is upset, the parent is later rewarded with an older child and adult who is able to regulate their own emotions, but also they enjoy a secure and trusting relationship with their parent, even in times of stress. That reflects back again on what brother Osman Umarji talked about having a very solid parent-child relationship. And personally, I'm taking care of my now two-year-old grandson, and he's at the stage where he's starting to get upset and have tantrums because he can't express what he wants us to know. And sometimes if I'm not understanding him, the best thing I found that I can do is just kind of put him on my lap and just give him a good, long, snuggly hug. And it does calm him down. So I think we've got something to learn from that. So if you're in doubt, try it out on a toddler. The prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, used to embrace the worst of people with a cheerful face and kind words and soften their hearts. He used to embrace me with a cheerful face and kind words until I thought that I was the best of people. So this reminds me that yet sometimes some people can be very hard to love, but we have to keep this in mind. You need to share your love and care with everybody, even those people that sometimes can really drive you up a tree. And lastly, there was a study that was done 
Um, this is really about self-efficacy by Dr. Emmy Werner, who began a study in 1955 that would last more than 40 years. When she and her colleagues, fo colleagues followed every child born that year on the Hawaiian island of Kauai, uh, there were about 700 of them. They found that um, in that place, it was not really set up you know, for tourism. There was not a lot of money. It was really not a privileged place at all. It was, it was rather poor. And the children were raised in poverty, unstable families, and the mothers never got a high school diploma at that time back there. But what happened by the age of 40, she found that a third of the group was competent and confident and caring. They defied the odds. They were all employed and they had very stable lives. And what was surprising, the differentiating factor that made these students seemingly successful is that they had a sense of resilience. They had a sense of an internal locus of control. They believed in themselves, not in their circumstances, but that they believed that they were in the driver's seat and that made all the difference in the world. So I think the lesson to be learned here is no matter what the circumstances, we have to keep a positive outlook, a growth mindset, and people believing that, of course, with Allah's help, that what they do can count and can matter. So inshallah, that will be um, the wrap up for what we have in the first segment today. I hope that inshallah you've enjoyed it and that you will enjoy some of the other tracks for a little bit, but do please make sure that you come back again for when Brother Wadud returns inshallah on Eastern time. That will be at, I believe, 2.30 on Central time. That's going to be at 1.30 and on Pacific time, that'll be at 11.30. If there are any questions at this point, I'm happy to take them. Otherwise, you're free to roam, but... Um, Go ahead and, and chat openly if you would like to, if there are any questions at this point. Or Sister Patricia, if there were any questions in the chat I've missed, please bring them forward. Uh, no, Sue, there weren't, there weren't any questions while you were talking. There were just yeah. comments, but they weren't questions. Well then, thank you so very kindly. I really appreciate you giving the extra time, Sister Patricia. You're heavily scheduled and moderating a lot today and I'm grateful for that. So thank you kindly. Thank you, thank you. All right then, Salaamu Alaikum everyone. Alaikum salam.